right, good afternoon, everyone. I know it's been a long day. Feel free to take a little stretch. Relax. Now, there's a problem with being the eighth speaker in a day, which is that all the good topics have been taken. Now, John and I were just talking about how we're at least a decade too old to understand influencer marketing, so I can't talk about that. However, as a good online native, I crowdsourced a whole bunch of ideas from all of you about what I should talk about today. So to demonstrate that we're all still awake, and also as a little bit of a social experiment into what people want to hear about at a day like today, I'd like to read you a quick synopsis of the topics that were proposed. If any of these sounds interesting for me to talk about, feel free to wave, clap, boo, something. And we'll use crowd influence here to decide which of these you're forced to listen to for the next 19 minutes. Fair? I don't have any slides, so I can talk about whatever I want. All right, here we go. Identity. Uh, what happens to the identity consortium? What does it mean that Google and DCM will no longer let marketers uh, get any user identification out of their ad server? Interesting one. All right. You should be booing, actually, that decision. Um, how do retailers compete with Amazon in a, in a post-GDPR and you know, post-advertising world? All right. Uh, GDPR. <laughs> will it come to the United States? Uh, will it reinforce the duopoly? Um, is this just like Y2K and who cares anymore? Okay, no. Um, and thank you for not making me talk about GDPR. I really appreciate it. All right, user experience. Will ads ever satisfy consumers? All right. Uh, is technology destroying empathy? Okay. Should publishers all just team up and build their own walled garden to compete with Facebook and Google? Uh, will consumers take control of their own data? Okay, the ethical role of ad tech, especially in political advertising. That's a good one. All right, we have to talk about blockchain. Will blockchain help ad tech survive uh, to win consumer trust, or is it just another ad tech tax? No blockchain. Good, thank you. I don't want to talk about blockchain either. Uh, this one was interesting. Should I be scared of having kids because of my career? Not sure this is exactly the right event for that one, but no, you shouldn't. Um, okay, to the crowd, what are you as IAB members doing to make the internet better? I don't know how I talk about that. So ponder. All right, video, the future of TV, and the forthcoming m and Palooza. Nope, okay. It's like when you lose Sky and the Americans take over. It's fine. Um, there are some sport questions. Um, what happens to the Premier League? What happens when LeBron James leaves Cleveland? I also didn't think those are the right questions for today. Um, okay, last one, trust. How do we restore trust in general? We've got Truth, which is the first blockchain agency here in town. Um, is this something that we can actually use to restore trust in agencies and in the industry? Okay, all right. So I think we'll start with identity because that seemed like it got some interesting feedback and we'll go from there. All right, so identity. Now, the first thing to just talk about quickly is what does identity mean? Now, a lot of people confuse identity with just data in general. So when I talk about identity, what I mean is the ability for a publisher or for a marketer to identify who a given consumer is. Now that could be your email address, that could be your postal address, that could just be a cookie. But I'll say that to define identity, we need to be able to tie across multiple devices or interaction points. This is still a major problem even for the big platforms. We all think that Google knows everything about us. Now, personally, 
I use Bing to search, uh, so Google doesn't know everything about me. Uh, I highly recommend that all of you consider that. But even so, I don't think these companies necessarily know everything about us, and that's good. For instance, if you have a Roku or an Apple TV or other connected TV device, it's very possible that there's no way to connect that TV interaction back to the rest of your profile. Um, I have an Apple TV, so Apple probably does know all of my different devices. In fact, if you go into iTunes, you can see all the devices you've signed into. But I'm pretty sure that nobody except for Apple has any idea that that TV is me. And in fact, since that TV is most often used to watch My Little Pony, it's really not, okay, fine, it's me. You caught me. Um, so that's the question for us. Where do we go with identity? Now, if you're German, you've got a bunch of single sign-on initiatives where you're trying to have some of the biggest companies in Germany actually create a single sign-on. So when you go to Lufthansa, or you go to Daimler, or you go to actual Springer, you have a single login where you as a consumer are now known by all of these companies who I guess you're supposed to trust to use that identity better than these big American tech giants. Some countries, um, especially the Baltics, are now issuing encrypted IDs to all their citizens. So as long as you trust your government, now you have a single ID given to you by the government that now you can use to, to connect to all your banking and other online services. So I think that's one extreme, where we effectively give over our identity either to our government or to these big corporate giants. Or we have Apple, who this week announced uh, something they call ITP 2.0, which is basically an attempt to destroy any use of cookies or tracking or, or ad tech across the entire internet. And of course, they announced this the same week they announced their own proprietary ad network. So <laughs> thank you, Apple. Now you own everything, and you've destroyed any idea of an independent internet. So that's an entirely different approach. Only Apple knows who you are. I'm not sure that's actually any better than having the governments or large corporations know. So for all of us in the online advertising and, and media space, I think we have a problem. We do need to know how these various interactions with consumers are going to tie back to some kind of purchase behavior. This is where we started the Identity Consortium. We announced it a year ago here in London. The idea that some of the largest companies ad tech companies, publishers, and marketers would come together to create a federated identifier that we could use to connect all of these different interactions. So if we show you an ad on your Roku, and then later on you hear a, a Spotify stream, and you hear an ad for, a, for an auto manufacturer, and then later on you're on your phone taking the train home, and you actually go and request a test drive, we can connect those interactions together with an anonymous, GDPR-safe, shared identifier. That, to me, is incredibly valuable for all aspects of our industry. We want publishers to get credit and content producers to get credit for those interactions that actually compel you to take purchase decisions, to change your behavior. And there's no way that we can give credit unless we have an identifier. That's why Google's decision to take their ID out of your hands with DCM is so stunning. We think that Google has this massive advantage in the sense that they know who we are across these interactions. But if they don't give that to you as a marketer or a brand, how can you give them credit? Sheryl Sandberg said about five years ago, what keeps her up at night is the fact that DoubleClick controls attribution and marketing. Now, that hasn't stopped Facebook. They found other ways to uh, grow a relatively large business. You might have heard of them. Um, but I feel like Google just gave away one of their most strategic advantages and also gave us all a chance to build a better identity. So for everyone in the room, I hope that what you go home or back to your office and do is think about how you can create some identity, some identifier that you can use across all these touch points with consumers. If you're a publisher, this is how you get credit for your world-class content. If you're a marketer, this is how you find out once and for all which of these interactions with consumers actually drives value. And if you're a consumer, thanks to GDPR, maybe you have a bit more confidence that we as an industry are actually doing good things with your data, that you can trust us with a little tiny bit of data about you, simply 
which of these interactions are you? And when you take a purchase decision, why? What can we connect that back to? And I think this will open up a new industry, actually. If you're fans of the Lumiscape, um, there's a new box, which is open identity-based attribution. We're gonna see companies start in the next years which are built around this identity consortium. Ad serving feels like it's a dead industry. You know, when was the last new ad server we saw started? But we need them now. Some of the biggest marketers in the world have called us in the past few weeks and said, who do you recommend we use instead of Google as an ad server? We didn't have any answers. <laughs> There's so few choices, but that's gonna change. So to me, this is something that we can all take action. We can look for those vendors, we can help those companies start, and we can pull our identity back out of the tech giants. I'm pretty excited about that. All right, that was one topic you requested. <laughs> hmm, not GDPR, right? All right, let's talk about the ethical role of ad tech. That, that got a pretty good amount of applause too. Sound good? So I'm kind of obsessed about the idea that ad tech should be ethical. That in fact, we are all doing I shouldn't say God's work, but a very important work when we're sitting here in the advertising industry. If you think about it, what we're doing is we're connecting all of these interesting companies to consumers. That's the entire foundation of capitalism, right? When you walk down the street, I guess you'd call it a high street here, and you see all these advertisements and billboards and signs, that's commerce. That's what fuels our economy. And that's what we do, whether it's through the mysterious influencer marketing or good old fashioned advertising, we're trying to get people to engage in commerce. And when we do that, the attention from the consumer is what the advertiser pays for. And that funds content, that funds journalism. If you're a journalist and you're asking yourself, should I put an ad blocker into my browser? You're taking money out of your own pocket. Now, if you're a publisher and you say, let's go to a subscription model, what you're basically doing is saying, the vast majority of consumers won't be able to afford your content. I'm very concerned about a world where the only free content, the only free news, is coming from billionaires who can afford to make something like Breitbart free for anyone who wants to read it. And all the good content, all the quality content, all the balanced content is behind a paywall. And that's why this political question becomes so interesting. In the US, we have Russians and other outside influencers putting hundreds of millions of dollars into political advertising on Facebook simply to influence people away from making choices in their own self-interest. You'll note that the American tax cuts, a trillion dollars went to the pockets of the biggest companies in the country, not to all those folks that vote, voted for Trump. So that level of influence that we have, actually I'm curious, how many of you think that Facebook advertising is so good that it can actually influence people's behavior. Any takers? Quite a few. I, I kind of think so too. I don't think people understand the difference between their crazy aunt posting some like wild conspiracy theory and Facebook advertising posting some crazy wild conspiracy theory. In fact, I think people are much more likely to click on the controversial crazy stuff on Facebook. That's why Content marketing works. You read some interesting article on the internet, and at the bottom it's like, 10 hottest footballers' wives. I'm like, what's a footballer? You know, I don't care about the wives. I just know what that word means. You know, I thought it was like a dictionary site where I could learn more. We as humans are so compelled by drama, by the interesting, by the, the strange. We, we click on these links. And that is where we as an industry, and I, I look at this broader, of course, than just ad tech, I look at this as the media businesses, I look at this as the agencies, I look at this as the governmental systems that effectively allow us to be in a dopamine-fueled, almost like a slot machine at casino, where we are giving consumers not the news they need, not the information they need, but what's the most compelling to click on. And that is all of our fault. So I think we do have an ethical decision to make. Are we going to continue as media buyers, to ask for our campaigns to have the highest click rates, the most post-view conversions? Are we gonna advertise regardless of the quality of the site or the quality of the content? Or are we gonna actually think a little bit about what's good 
for the consumer, what's good for the brand. I'm so tired of seeing you know, YouTube run on jihadi websites and, and, and just say, oh, our bad. You know, the artificial intelligences that run Google didn't notice that. How many of you have stopped working with YouTube? Does anyone here not go to YouTube as a consumer or not work with YouTube as a brand? We have a couple of, of non-YouTubers. I'm impressed. That's a really, really hard thing to do in these days when to learn how to windsurf, you kind of have to go to YouTube, right? All information is now being moved onto these platforms. So here's my ask of all of you, is that we can make this more ethical, that we have an opportunity right now. I think GDPR is a perfect excuse to work with fewer partners. As a brand, that means restrict where you spend your money. 20, 50, 100 partners. Are there really more than 100 quality places that you can spend your money in a market like the UK? I'd be surprised if there are. JP Morgan Chase in the US was very proud that they hired a summer intern to take their whitelist from four or 5,000 sites down to a few hundred. And I have to be honest, a summer intern? Like that's your investment in brand safety? And you still found 400 or 500 different places that were worth your money to advertise? Did you turn off Facebook? Did you turn off YouTube? Did you turn off social? Of course not. So that's something we can do as brands. Now, publishers, you have a major role to play here too. Can you please turn off content marketing? Can you just turn off Taboola and Outbrain and all those crazy links on your site that confuse consumers and make them leave? Is that that hard? And while you're doing that, why don't you think about that consent form? Maybe choose 30 partners, not 12. I think we can agree 12 is not enough. But how many partners do we really trust with our users' data? Anybody have a good number? What, what's, what's the minimum number of vendors you need to get most of the advertising you want? Thank you for your contributions. I agree. <laughs> More than 12, less than 50. So that's another way that we can be ethical because it prevents this incredible breadth of advertisers and intermediaries and ad tech companies from coming between us and our advertising. And finally, we have to ask ourselves a big question. Do we want government to regulate our industry? I'm kind of a fan of the idea behind GDPR. I think that privacy should be a human right. It has to be a human right, in fact. And I don't know if GDPR is the perfect regulation to get there, but it's a heck of a start. I'm not sure, though, that we want the government or the governments in Europe to be consistently adding levels of regulation to force us to do the right thing. GDPR shouldn't have been necessary. We should have had too much respect for our consumers, for our users, for ourselves, and of course we don't. So that's what we can do. We can take ethical decisions every day. We can ask ourselves the question, <laughs> in five years or 10 years, will the government have to regulate me? Should I really be giving all of my user data to Chinese phone manufacturers? Probably not. You know, Cambridge Analytica, that sounds really sophisticated. Maybe I shouldn't just let them go steal a whole bunch of people's data. Maybe I don't want to be in front of the European Commission in five years explaining why I did it. So thank you all for choosing my topics. I hope I did a decent job of covering them. And uh, thank you all so much for letting me be here.